He used to be called Citizen 625726. He used to call himself Unbroken. When he left his dystopian city behind, he thought he had found paradise. What he found was uglier and darker than anything he could have imagined. This is his story. This is Inferior. Now available at Amazon, Smashwords, and at studiobrainstorm.net. Links in the description. For the Guru, each of the Lost Tribes is a painful moment in the history of their people. A terrible loss both for them and the cause of Gaia. But of the three, there is no loss that is felt more painfully, more often lamented, than that of the Croatan. And this is especially the case if you're talking to their brother tribes, quote-unquote, the Uctena and the Wendigo. Long, long ago, back in the days when the first Guru came to be, there were three tribes of werewolves that, unlike the others, stuck together. So closely, in fact, that they often referred to themselves as brothers. Elder brother, middle brother, and younger brother. Of course, as brothers tend to do, sometimes they quarreled. One moonlit night, the leaders of the three brother tribes met and had an argument about whose deeds were the greatest which among them had earned the most renown. In Werewolf the Apocalypse, renown is the measure of a werewolf's place in his society, his tribe, his sept, etc. Renown can be gained in one of three ways. Glory, which is won through martial prowess, either in fighting the enemies of Gaia or in defense of one's people. Wisdom, which is gained through demonstration of one's knowledge and judgment in crisis. And honor, which is gained through showing respect to others, serving Gaia through rites and protection, and upholding the ways and litany of their people. The three brothers argued over who had gained the most renown. Then they fought about it. And then at last, middle brother called an end to the fight and said that they should undertake a spirit journey. They would go into the Umbra, face the tests of the spirits that dwelled within, and have them judge which among them was the greatest. Elder and younger brother agreed to his plan, and so the three prepared themselves for the journey ahead. Each in his own way fasted and performed various rituals to purify themselves spiritually for the great test to come. Elder brother bathed in a river and allowed his impatience with his younger siblings to flow away with the current. Middle brother stretched out on the earth, attuned his heartbeat to the beat of the world, and allowed his envy of his elder brother's wisdom and younger brother's bravery to soak away into the soil. Little brother ran north until he found a winter storm and allowed the fierce wind and freezing cold to blow away his anger and impatience. The brothers reunited, and after ten more days of rituals, a moon bridge was formed and the three walked into the spirit world together. Many tests and struggles they faced, and each of the brother responded in their characteristic fashion. Little brother always faced the challenge head-on, charging boldly forward regardless of consequence. Elder brother, more shrewd by far, always sought the cleverest solution to a problem. Middle brother, meanwhile, often played peacemaker when his two siblings argued. Whenever a challenge confronted him, he always sought the most honorable solution. At last, the tests concluded, and all three brothers were confronted with a terrible vision of a shadow that consumed all in its path. Each responded according to his nature. Little brother vowed to fight and destroy it. Elder brother vowed to study it and find the best way to defeat it. Middle brother vowed to do all in his power, sacrifice anything, to stop it. Then the vision ended, and all three brothers were confronted by an aspect of Gaia, the spirit of Mother Nature herself. She praised all three brothers, saying that each of their deeds was of equal renown, merely of a different kind. Elder brother had gained renown through his wisdom. Little brother had gained renown through glory, while middle brother had gained renown through honor. Then the spirit of Gaia wept and warned middle brother that he should never mistake pride for honor, that he should always be open to accepting help from others, 
Perhaps then he might not make the terrible choice that she feared he might one day make. Time passed, and in those ancient days, the werewolves did not have the conception of time that modern humans do, so they've no way of knowing exactly how long. But one night, during the Impergium, Elder Brother received a vision. Hearing the sound of a woman weeping, his dream self looked for the source, eventually finding a woman, bent low with grief. When asked what was wrong, the woman told Elder Brother that she came from a land that was being ravaged by monsters with no wolf changer to defend it. When Elder Brother awoke, he spoke to his brothers of it, and both middle and younger brother said that they too had received visions. Clearly, the visions were a message from Gaia, and the three brothers on the spot pledged to come to the aid of Grandmother Earth. After another dream vision in which Elder Brother fought and bested a reptilian servant of the worm, he reaffirmed the pledge of his brothers and himself to Gaia and protecting the Pure Lands from the monsters that ravaged its undefended realm. Gaia thanked him, saying that she had sent visions to all the tribes, but that only the three brothers had answered. And so, Elder, Middle, and Younger Brother gathered up all their human and wolf kinfolk and began the long journey. Only one of the other tribes accompanied them, a stargazer Theurge named Crescent Vision. And at first, the three brothers were wary of him, but after he passed several tests of his strength and commitment to the cause, they welcomed him into their ranks. The journey was long and hard. Not only did the people have to endure the harsh conditions of the tundra as they crossed from Siberia over to Alaska, but they also had to contend with the minions of the worm at every turn. Twisted monsters and malevolent banes stalked the three brothers and their people at every step. Those who fell behind or got separated almost always died. Warrior packs were sent out to guard the flanks, while others were sent into the Umbra itself to defend against spiritual attacks. But the werewolves did not fight this battle alone. Many spirits of nature, including their three respective tribal totems and their broods, aided them in the great struggle. And while there is some debate at which point during this journey that the totems of the Uctena and Wendigo became what they are in the modern nights, there is no doubt that middle brother, the Croaton, had always been the children of Turtle, a powerful, patient, and honorable spirit of water and earth, said to carry the world upon its back. All spirits in Werewolf the Apocalypse, if they choose to give their blessings upon a guru or his pack, always impose specific conditions known as bans upon the guru in question. In those days, an individual or pack that was able to earn the favor of Turtle would be given greater strength of body and mind. But Turtle was a spirit of honor above all else, and he demanded that any werewolf to whom he gives his gifts must never lose honor permanently or fail to defend his home. Those who did otherwise were not worthy of his blessing. As his chosen tribe, the Croaton enjoyed particular blessings from Turtle, mostly associated with Earth. The Croaton were especially gifted at purifying the soil, which is why even centuries after contact with the Europeans, Croaton cairns are among the purest in all of the New World, even with the growing influence of the worm. Also, according to the excellent sourcebook Croaton's Song, they could also become one with the Earth or manipulate it at will so you could argue they were essentially werewolf earthbenders. But at any rate, at last the three brothers managed to fight their way across the Bering Land Bridge and into North America, the Pure Lands. But they didn't cross over all at once. While this is often described as a journey, it was in reality more of a human migration. And so the human and wolf kinfolk of the three brothers and their tribes came over in bits and pieces. Some, in fact, delayed so long that eventually the sea rose and the Bering Land Bridge disappeared, covered by the waters of the Bering Strait. Of course, the three brothers eventually set about to slaying the various worm creatures they encountered, while at the same time marking out territory for their respective tribes. The Wendigo chose the north, with its icy winds and fearsomely cold temperatures. The Uctena favored the southwest, with its sun-baked plains and shining rivers while the Croaton favored the forest and woodland east of the Mississippi. In the meantime, in order to help their kinfolk that were stuck on the other side of the sea, the three brothers established the Cairn of Triumph and Sorrow, 
and they incorporated a path stone into the cairn's construction so that those on the other side could travel across the water via a moon bridge. Thus, they could just go through the spirit world and completely bypass the water altogether. While a few did go back to try and find out what had happened on the far side of the strait, no one heard from the lost kin for some time. Then, at last, a crow spirit traveled across the seas and brought terrible news to the three brothers. The lost kinfolk were indeed traveling via the moon bridge and the umbra to the new world, but they were sorely pressed by the minions of the worm. Help was desperately needed. At first, though, even though many war packs went into the umbra to help their kin, they could not find them. At last, Crescent Visions, the stargazer Theurge, discovered that they were being hidden from the sight of their werewolf kin by a malevolent bane. The evil spirit had hidden them behind a barrier of silver mirrors, and at first Crescent Visions hesitated. For, when he had chosen to accompany the three brothers from the old world, a vision had warned him that the journey would cost him his life. But, a true servant of Gaia to the very end, Crescent Visions charged the mirror, shattering it so that his fellows could find their lost kin. But in the process, his flesh was lacerated by the silver shards. The war packs of the three brothers' tribes slew the monstrous minions of the worm and liberated their kinfolk, and then gathered in mourning beside the dying body of the warrior who had proven himself their brother in spirit, if not blood. The Theurges that had accompanied the war packs did all in their power to save him, but even their power could not overcome the bite of silver. Before he died, Crescent Visions advised his friends to close the moon bridge connecting the Cairn of Triumph and Sorrow with the far side of the Bering Strait. For the minions of the worm, particularly those that had arranged this trap, were cunning indeed and could not be allowed to set foot in the Pure Lands. The other werewolves did as he suggested. And so, though the Cairn of Triumph and Sorrow would exist for some time to come, it could no longer be accessed via the spirit world. Time passed, and the werewolves did what they had come to the Pure Lands to do, fight off and destroy the minions of the worm, while at the same time trying not to step too hard on the toes of the changing breeds that were already in North America. The werebears were few in number, but reasonably good neighbors, and while the werepumas kept insisting that they could have dealt with the worm monstrosities themselves, they too elected not to make a stink about the issue. Werewolf territory only really ceased in central Mexico. There, the were-jaguars held sway, and they were very, very protective of their holdings and kin. The shapeshifters were not alone in their great struggle. Their human kinfolk, as well as human magic users, usually shamans, played a part in fighting off the corrupting forces of the worm and its vile minions. Back then, the gauntlet was thin, and you could walk into the spirit world purely by accident. And so a lot of people, not just the werewolves, were very invested in keeping out threats from the spirit world. But, as has been the case since time immemorial, there were just never enough Pharah to do the job. Even when a werewolf mates with one of its kinfolk, the odds of producing a full-blooded guru is 1 in 10. There are no odds given for a non-kinfolk mating, but they must be even lower. And the werewolves were among the more populous of the changing breeds. The other pharah were, if anything, even fewer in number. And for all their gifts of the spirit world, no shapeshifter can be everywhere at once. All too often, humans had to take matters into their own hands in order to be safe from the worm-tainted monsters that went bump in the night. But humans have limited spirit power, and so their ability to fend off that which threatened them was limited. And so, one day in southern Mexico, one tribe of humans made a fateful decision. Because they could not entirely rely upon the servants of the wild to ensure their safety, they turned to the weaver. While in the modern nights it is easy for werewolves to look back on this and call it a mistake, this was not such an unreasonable or unthinkable occurrence as one might expect. While the Weaver is an antagonistic force in Werewolf the Apocalypse, she is not outright evil in the way that the Worm has become. The Weaver is a spirit of order and stability, things that are desirable and beneficial. The problem is that the Weaver goes too far. And so, when the ancient Mexicans turned to her for aid, the weaver, who had always loved humanity for its cleverness and its ability to make tools, was happy to oblige. 
and she bestowed upon them three gifts that would alter their world forever. The calendar, the pyramid temple, and corn farming. The adoption of the calendar enabled humans to alter time itself. The days of the year were brought to order, and through consensus and sheer force of will, humans made it so that spirits could only interfere in the affairs of the living at certain times of the year or under specific conditions. Thus, through their own willpower, the gauntlet was thickened and the spirit world that much harder to reach. Of course, modern werewolves look back on this and shake their heads, but it did make the world safer for those humans. Such is the nature of the weaver's gifts. It always comes at a cost, but also there is always a benefit. As Mesoamerican culture shifted towards the order that the weaver promised them, the humans of those lands began to eschew villages for cities and huts made of stone. And this eventually led to grand temple pyramids, pyramids that elevated them above the earth and put man closer to the heavens. And so humans began to forget their connections to the earth and the soil and the spirits of the earth. Instead, they looked ever upward, venerating the stars and other celestial bodies. And above all else, they venerated Helios, the spirit of the sun. Known as Kinich Ahau to the Maya or Huitzilopochtli to the Aztecs, the sun became the focus of their worldview, to the point where they began to believe mistakenly that the sun was the source of all life. All too easily, they forgot that it is the earth that makes life. The sun merely helps sustain it. But by far the greatest and most important of these three gifts was a spirit of the weaver's making, but one with the blessings of Gaia, a spirit named Corn Woman. Maize corn is one of the most important cereal crops ever cultivated by man. More resistant to disease than wheat or barley, each of its grains packs far more energy than wheat or rice. Today, it is the most widely cultivated plant on Earth and it became the bedrock of the pre-Columbian North American diet. When Corn Woman was first introduced, the wary guru met with this new spirit and were quickly convinced of her benevolence. All that mattered to Corn Woman was that the humans honor her and not take the bounty that she offered for granted. The Croaton in particular promised enthusiastically to ensure this, and thus the werewolves themselves helped spread corn farming among the peoples of North America. But as Mesoamerican civilization grew in the South, it was more than just corn farming that began to spread beyond its borders. The ideas of civilization are ever tempting to humans, and it was only a matter of time until some of the Croatan's kinfolk began to adopt some of the ways of the South. And thus we come to the most pivotal moment in pre-Columbian North America, the event that, for the first time in their history, would drive an irreconcilable wedge between the three brothers, the Mississippian Mound Builders and Cahokia. The Mississippi River had always been the heartland of the Croatan tribe and their human kinfolk, and it was along the banks of this river and the eastern lands watered by it between 800 and 1600 AD that a new culture arose to prominence, the Mississippians. Through trade and commerce, they were introduced to the customs and ways of the southern peoples, and so came to adopt many of their ways and ideas. They built cities, they developed trade routes and commerce. Local stone was hard to come by, so they couldn't build the great pyramids of the south, so instead they settled for massive mounds of tamped earth. But alas, the influence did not stop there. Though many sources dispute the exact origin, somewhere deep in the south, some Mesoamericans came to believe that their gods demanded blood in exchange for their protection. And so, human sacrifice began to spread among the peoples of the South and even the peoples of the North. The Mississippians, who had long looked to the South in terms of cultural influence, began to adopt the practice of human sacrifice as well, much to the dismay of the Croatan. As a general rule, the Croatan were very tolerant of their human kin. So long as what they did did not explicitly violate the teachings of Gaia, the Croatan were happy to let the humans live as they wished. But as time passed and Mississippian culture spread, more and more humans began to abandon the village and the tribe for the cities. Greatest of all these cities was Cahokia. Founded on the opposite bank of the Mississippi from the site of St. Louis, 
It covered six square miles, boasted some of the highest earthen mounds in all of Mississippian culture, as well as a population between 10 and 20,000 people, the largest of any city north of Mexico, as well as rigid hierarchies, social inequality, and a lot of human sacrifice. All three brothers were aware of this and began arguing over what to do about it. The Wendigo figured that the Mississippians, and especially the people of Cahokia, were irrevocably tainted and wanted to kill them all. They blamed the Croatan for not acting swiftly enough, and they blamed the Uctena for helping facilitate the spread of these southern influences of blood sacrifice. The Uctena, for their part, wanted to be more circumspect and discover what was going on. They figured that study would help them figure out where these influences had come from and that there might be useful information to be gleaned from it. Naturally, the Croatan objected on the basis that these were their kinfolk and that little and elder brother had no say in the matter. Each tribe has a different account of exactly what happened next. The Uctena and Wendigo versions of the account will have to wait for their own videos. But suffice it to say, the end result of all this was a lot of bad blood that would linger for many decades. And for the first time, the three brothers were no longer quite the united front they once had been back when they had first crossed the land bridge to North America. The Croatan account of what happened has been preserved by the Uctena and Wendigo out of respect for their fallen brother. At any rate, when the Croatan decided that something had to be done, they wished to avoid violence if at all possible, as they felt that such action might only fuel the worm. And so a theurge named Three Scars was sent to investigate. Assuming Hamid form and pretending to be a shaman from the north, he was welcomed by the priests and brought forward to witness one of the blood sacrifices. While everyone's attention was focused on the ritual, three scars stepped sideways into the spirit world and saw, coiled beneath the great earthen mound upon which the sacrifice was being performed, a giant black serpent. Through cunning, he tricked the serpent into revealing its true nature. However, he learned that not only was the serpent a servant of the worm, but it was a servant of a specific aspect of the worm. Thus, the Croatan learned that the worm was not merely a singular being. It had three great aspects, believed to be created as a mocking parody of the three brothers. Ever since coming to North America, the three tribes had only had to contend with one aspect, the Beast of War, the little brother of the Triadic Worm. The Beast of War is an avatar of rage and violence, a lover of chaos and destructive terror. In the modern nights, the beast of war incites hatred and violence in the human heart, and is thus the source of all the great and terrible wars that have occurred. But the beast of war is unsubtle, knowing only violence. The Black Serpent told Three Scars of two other aspects of the worm, far more dangerous in their own ways. The Eater of Souls, the middle brother of the Triadic Worm. As its name implies, this aspect of the Triadic Worm is consumed by hunger and the desire to devour all things. It is the Eater of Souls that infects the minds and souls of humans with lust, greed, and desire. From the petty thief to the corrupt business mogul, such humans, knowingly or not, serve the interests of the Eater of Souls. And then there was the elder brother of the Triadic Worm, the master of the black serpent beneath the mound, the defiler worm, the source of all corruption and decay. From this aspect comes the human impulse to pollute and degrade all that is good in Gaia's creation. Pentex and its board of directors being the most famous servant of the defiler in the modern nights. At that point, however, Three Scars' luck ran out and the black serpent realized that it had been tricked. By pure chance, or perhaps the will of Gaia, one of the were-ravens, the Korax, was nearby, and Three Scars managed to tell it to go fly off and warn his brothers of what was happening before engaging the Black Serpent in combat. I say combat, but it was more like a standoff. Three Scars had come prepared to fight this terrible menace, if need be, and the worm spirit was a cautious creature. Unlike a servant of the Beast of War, which would have fought Three Scars head-on, as a servant of the Defiler, the Black Serpent was a subtle thing. It worked through corruption, not through combat. 
At any rate, the standoff lasted until three Scar's tribe mates came to his aid, forcing the Black Serpent to flee deeper into the Umbra. Three Scar's returned safely to the Croaton and told them the terrible truths that he had discovered. The children of Turtle were forced to recognize that there was no choice now. Even if it meant violence against their own human kin, the influence of the Defiler Worm had to be torn out root and branch. In secret, the Croaton approached their human kin who lived among the Mississippians and told them to leave the Mound Cities behind and never return. Heeding their werewolf kindred, these humans did so. But it was noticed and brought about the ire of one of the most powerful shamans of the Mississippians, the one who called himself the Brother of the Sun. A man of mighty spirit power, he demanded to know why the Croaton were sending their kin away. Perhaps seeing one last chance to end this without bloodshed, the Croaton sent a delegation led by Three Scars to reason with the Shaman. Three Scars told the story of his encounter with the serpent beneath the mound, and warned Brother of the Sun that he and his people would have nothing to do with him as long as he continued his practices of blood sacrifice. For clearly this was of the worm, and the Croaton would never serve such a thing. Whether motivated by pride or his own corruption, Brother of the Sun responded in anger. How dare the Croaton say that his ways were evil? How dare they turn their back on him and his fellow Sun worshippers? Enraged, the Shaman summoned a bolt of fire that consumed the brave Three Scars. Enraged, the Croaton threw themselves upon Brother of the Sun, but the man possessed mighty spirit power. Even with his throat torn out, he not only managed to stay alive, but summoned a wall of fire between him and the attacking Guru. Unable to get at their quarry, the Croaton returned to their senses and fled into the Umbra, taking the dying Three Scars with them. The last path to peace was closed forever. War now broke out between the kinfolk of the Croaton and those who followed the ways of Brother of the Sun. And while the humans fought, the Croaton prepared. Aided by their cousins in the Uctena and Wendigo tribes, packs of Croaton gathered around each of the major mound cities across the Mississippian world and prepared a mighty ritual. On the same night, at the rising of the moon, almost in unison, the werewolves began beating drums and shaking fetish rattles, summoning Turtle himself to aid them. And the mighty spirit that bore the world upon his shell shook his great broad back and the earth began to tremble. The river burst its banks and flooded the land. Great chasms opened beneath the feet of those who attempted to flee. The great mounds of the Mississippians collapsed into ruin. Countless humans and even a few careless werewolves were swallowed up. Brother of the Sun was never seen again. The werewolves had shown the humans the power of Gaia's children. And the humans learned the lesson well. They abandoned the ruined cities. They returned to their tribal lifestyle. And while they still continued to grow corn and pay reverence to Corn Woman, no more would they seek to appease the spirits that served her through blood. A few Indian tribes, like the Natchez, would continue Mississippian practices up into the 18th century, but in time that too came to an end. And yet, despite having worked together to root out this worm corruption, relations between the three brothers were never quite the same. The arguments over the Mississippians and the bad feelings that had come from them lingered. And for the first time in their history, they became increasingly distant from one another. And then came the fateful year of 1585 and the Roanoke Colony. Founded by Sir Walter Raleigh and Sir Ralph Lane, who was its first governor, Roanoke Colony was the first attempt by England to establish a colony in the New World. It ended up being quite disastrous. The colonists had come unprepared for local conditions, particularly the hard winter, and had not brought enough food with them. The supply ships intended to sustain the fledgling colony were delayed. The colonists began to starve and suffer from disease. No one knows for sure what happened next. Some say that the scale of the misery of the Roanoke colony, unknown in the New World up until that point, shifted the balance somehow within the spirit world. Still others insist that it was something that the white men had brought with them from the Old World. 
Whatever the cause, an opening was created, and from it emerged the Eater of Souls, the middle brother aspect of the Triadic Worm. Some sources insist that by feeding upon the suffering and misery of the colonists, the Eater of Souls prepared to bring about the apocalypse right then, and the Croatons sprang into action to stop it. As with everything else surrounding Roanoke, no one knows what happened next. No one knows why the Croaton acted alone. Some say that the Croaton did so because there was no time to call for help. Still others insist that the Croaton acted alone out of pride, refusing to call upon either the Wendigo or the Uctena. Whatever the reason, the Croaton performed a mighty and mysterious ritual, grievously injuring the Eater of Souls and banishing it back to Malpheus from whence it had crawled. But this victory was bought at a terrible price. Every single werewolf of the Croaton tribe died that day. Nearly all of their lupus and Hamid kinfolk died alongside them. The few that survived were incapable of having children, and so when they died a few years later, any last hope of the Croatons' restoration died with them. When at last another expedition from England, led by John White, arrived at the site of the Roanoke colony, all they could find was the word Croaton carved into the wooden palisade. Not a single human soul was found therein. Turtle was so devastated by the loss of his tribe that he sunk into a deep slumber, and it is very rare that any guru can successfully call upon him, even in the modern nights. The Uctena and the Wendigo, elder and younger brother, were devastated. Each in their own way blamed themselves for failing to help middle brother when he'd needed them most. And even when they were busy taking Croatan land for themselves during early colonization, the Old World Guru would hear the story of the Croatan's sacrifice and pay them honor. Even in the modern nights, the memory of the Croatan and their great sacrifice is respected by all Guru. In many ways, the fate of the Croatan is both a salutary and ominous example to all werewolves. Most recognize that the fight against the worm is a hopeless one, and that the best they can expect is that they can take the deadly spirit with them when the War of the Apocalypse finally begins. The Croatan died honorably, serving Gaia and striking a mighty blow against her enemies. In that sense, the Croatan set the greatest example for all the other tribes. Every werewolf is taught to give his or her all for Gaia, and in that sense, there is perhaps no greater example than the sacrifice of the Croaton. Special thanks to subscribers The Soul of the Dragon for voting for this on Subscribestar. See? Voting does matter, people, so join up.